good afternoon and welcome to all of you who have joined us so far. Uh, thank you for tuning in for what we hope will be a fantastic hour. Uh, this is the third seminar in the Women in STEM seminar series. This seminar is on women and sustainable food systems, different perspectives towards a healthier world. Um, this seminar series is organized by the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Education Committee at the Grantham Institute here at Imperial College. And we're thrilled to be joined by two inspiring women who work in STEM, uh, Dr. Tilly Collins and Louise Mabulo, to discuss the amazing work that they're doing towards improving the sustainability of our food systems. So our food systems are unique in that they strongly link environmental and human health. Uh, global food production significantly impacts our environment at the moment through, for example, greenhouse gas emissions, land use change, soil erosion and water pollution with agrochemicals, which combined threaten climate stability and the resilience of our e ecosystems. On top of this, we're faced with different forms of malnutrition around the world. Um, many people still lack enough food, while many more have low quality diets, which are energy rich, but nutrient poor, or many more are just consuming too much food. Um, and this dichotomy often exists side by side in the same country. So food is obviously a vastly complex topic, um, which is interconnected with so many other social, cultural and economic issues. But in this seminar, we're hoping to discuss some of these issues, as well as solutions from the perspectives of our speakers and the work that they do. So for this afternoon's discussion, um, I will be the chair. Um, I'm a PhD student here at Imperial College as part of the Grantham Institute's Science and Solutions for a Changing Planet Doctoral Training Partnership. Uh, my research focuses on ways of assessing the environmental environmental sustainability of food and diets using life cycle and optimization approaches. Um, for the format of the seminar, um, we'll start with introductions from our speakers and then I'll kick us off with the main discussion. Um, after that, we will have time for a Q&A session. So if you have any questions, please do write them in the Zoom chat as we go along and then we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. Um, we also ask if you could please include your name and affiliation with your question. Um, also, a few housekeeping rules. We would greatly appreciate it if you could please keep your audio muted during the main discussion. Um, and then during the Q&A session, we'll give you the option of asking your question yourself. So please unmute yourself in that case. Um, in addition to writing questions in the chat, you can also use the chat to ask for any assistance or clarification. Um, lastly, this session will be recorded and the recording will be made available afterwards. So I'll hand over now to Tilly to start us off with speaker introductions. Again, thank you so much to both of our speakers for joining us and welcome. Thank you so much, Ellie. Welcome to everybody. Um, my name is Tilly Collins, and I'm one of the deputy directors of the Centre for Environmental Policy at Imperial College. But by training, I'm an entomologist. I did my PhD at Silwood Park with Simon Leather, studying the aphids that infest our biomass crops. But I've been constantly impressed through my studies that the amazing efficiency and versatility of insects and I one day got a student who, who was passionate about eating insects. And that started me on this path from which I've become quite a strong advocate for eating insects. And I, I, I like them. I like that I'm offered them in different parts of the world and that there's this real variety of tastes and traditions. I like that they are so amazingly nutritionally dense and often have quite high fat contents, but are very low in carbs. There's, there's nothing I don't like about them apart from eating them live. I'm not good at that, but I, I'm a great advocate for the efficiency and versatility of insects as part of our diet, but also as part of the, the feed process of diet for uh, fish and for fowl, and the ways that they can be used in recycling for feed. So that's, that's my great interest in sustainable food systems is let's eat insects. Oh, 
Oh, then I guess I could take it away for the next part. Um, thank you again for the lovely introduction, Alicia. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Louise Mampulo. I'm a farmer, chef, and entrepreneur. I'm a United Nations Young Champion of the Earth and a Forbes Under 30 Entrepreneur and the founder of the Cacao Project, which is working in my small hometown here in the Philippines to build sustainable and resilient livelihoods for farmers. Um, I began this work in the aftermath of Super Typhoon Not 10, which destroyed over 80% of agricultural land in my hometown. And I realized that because of the impacts of climate change and the vulnerability of farmers in um, a particularly disaster prone community, there was a lot that young people like me could do to take the lead in um, finding climate adaptable solutions within our food systems and working closely with farmers to harness the power of our landscapes and the air, the soil, the water um, to bring better adaptability and nature-based solutions within our food system at the grassroots level. And this is kind of what propelled me into the work that I do today and my love for food. And I really look forward to hearing from Tilly and all the different stories from everyone here about how there's so many intersectionalities between our food systems from farming and agriculture and even gender. So looking forward to speaking with everyone today. Thank you. Thank you both. Right. So the first question I have for you both, which you both have covered uh, briefly, but if you could go in more detail, is what motivated you to engage with food sustainability or sustainability in general? So Tilly, I guess for you, if you could go first, like what first drew you to even work in this space as a researcher? Well, as I said, I, I was brought into it by a student, but it's also because, you know, I, I raised three kids in a dense urban environment and I want to be doing as best as I can for the environment I, but I want my kids to be healthy I want them to have a, a diverse diet and I, I want to not eat in a way that's terribly bad for the environment so I've been thinking about food sustainability and and what information is available to me as as a mum and uh, just as you know essentially as a housewife I, I'm lucky I have a lot of information at my fingertips but it's not easy to make the decisions about food sustainability and sustainable food systems on the information that we have. And it's, it's become very interesting to think that we can really use insects in a much more powerful way to recycle agricultural wastes and make them into a productive protein part of our diets. So I, I come to it through meeting a very passionate student and wanting to support their work and then gradually taking on elements and I come to it as, as a mum who wants to feed her children sustainably and healthily. And also I come to it increasingly through the lens of, of sustainable food systems in other parts of the world where insect eating is still very dominant. And, and I think it's absolutely fascinating that insects exist both in very high culture and very low culture elements of food, but they're being squeezed out in the middle classes. Insects are, are fascinating as really luxurious items in some food systems, but they're also perceived as the food of the poor in many ways. And that, that's something we need to begin to think yeah. about before it gets eradicated. So I have a very interest, I have a great cultural interest as well. I, I'd like to be able to do a bit more work in Africa, collecting the language associated with insect eating and the, the, the recipes, how do people cook insects? How are we going to be able to help support the preservation of those traditions? Because that's, that's an absolutely fascinating area of research. Which um, countries at the moment have insects as part of their diet? And I guess, um, is this growing? Is this declining? Are we losing that cultural knowledge that you speak about? I think in, in large parts of the world, we are losing that cultural knowledge, but we're also developing farming, insect farming systems in very many parts of the world. In Asia, there has been a huge leap in insect farming and very efficient systems. In Europe, we've got some extraordinary insect farms now, which can produce fly larvae very, very rapidly and very, very efficiently. And that mostly goes into to animal feeds. We have uh, some ex-students from this department who have a brilliant startup in Paris 
called Tomojo, which was originally Entomojo. And they, they are making enormous quantities of dog food from fly larvae. Uh, there, there are, there's just a huge growth in insect farming, but it's starting to take off in Africa as well. So a lot of the bigger and juicier insects are still very available, but the production systems for producing things like insect meal and insect flour, which are really nutritionally dense and really delicious, are starting to come to the fore as well. And we're, we're getting technology transfer from the Europeans and from the Americans through to African systems. So we're getting the, the production going there, but you're right that, that unless we act quite soon, because Africa is a continent where by and large people don't live till they're terribly old. And this, this repository of knowledge of insect eating is mostly in the elderly population. And it should be gathered sooner rather than later. We should be collecting this really fascinating cultural knowledge. So speaking of farming systems, uh, this brings us nicely to Louise. Um, if you could share your motivations for starting the Cacao Project and also if you could give some uh, information on what, what the Cacao Project is. Oh, definitely. Um, well, I started in this journey. To tell you the story, I began in the food systems and culinary journey way back when I was 12 years old. I was this really curious kid who loved hanging out in kitchens, and I ended up as a finalist in a TV reality show called Junior MasterChef. Um, and through that show, I got caught up in the whole whirlwind of a very, very early culinary career. At 16, I was called like a culinary prodigy of the Philippines. And beyond cooking, I love the process of growing my own ingredients and curating uh, farm to table meals and pop up dinners. So that was kind of the trajectory of my life and my career and how I wanted to address things. But I mentioned earlier, it got completely turned around and um, sidetracked by the super typhoon that came in um, on Christmas Day. And my town was hit by Super Typhoon Knock 10 um, on a seemingly ordinary day when people weren't expecting this insane typhoon to flip our lives around. And it destroyed 80% of uh, agricultural land and a thousand homes in my municipality alone. And it was my first experience of seeing loss and damage to our food systems and its impacts on people and livelihoods and peace and security. Um, so we see these disasters happening every year in increasing intensity, aggravated by climate change and unsustainable practices. And in the loss and damage of this aftermath, I realized that um, I could not live with myself if I didn't do something, especially someone with platform and opportunities at hand. I knew that I could take action and I was in a very privileged position to be able to do so. Um, and this was a systemic food systems issue where our farmers are left vulnerable and um, even despite the fact that typhoons are a factor that you can't control. So that propelled me into the journey of starting the cacao project and implementing um, a typhoon relief project, which transformed into this food systems uh, intervention. We work under three branches, which one of them is education through farmer field schools, mutual collaborative experiences, and like what Tilly had mentioned, preserving traditional knowledge systems in our food and learning from our elders so that young people can pass the torch, so to speak. Um, and the other branch is in agriculture, of course, building disaster resilient uh, livelihoods for farmers and giving them these interventions. And as well as in uh, regeneration, tree planting, protecting soil biodiversity. So all these different things um, are because we realize that our food systems are very comprehensive. And there's a lot of different factors that come into play. And to do that, you need a holistic solution that is mildly risky, also very innovative, and um, would also disassemble existing cultural stigmas surrounding our food systems and production chains. So because of this project, I found myself hovering over vats of silky liquid chocolate, making different chocolate produce, or uh, talking to farmers on the ground to cultivate these agroforests and getting my hands muddy, planting trees, um, and creating policy interventions in our food systems. And that incredible journey allowed me to be where I am today, 
uh, I've been able to collaborate and get recognition from institutions like the UN and National Geographic, where it has focuses on conservation, land stewardship, land management, um, and the many different intricacies of food beyond just the idea of planting out in a field. And because of these experiences, that's why I'm here with you sharing how uh, women in STEM and how gender can also intersect within our food systems and science. And that's kind of the story of how it all got started in the long and winding storytelling fashion. <laughs> so um, when you got started with Cacao Project, did you find that you were faced with any challenges or barriers or challenges and barriers that you're still facing in your work right now? Absolutely. Um, I think, well, I'd mentioned this earlier, but one of the things that we've seen right at the get go is cultural stigmas associated to food systems, agriculture, even sustainability and green jobs, where, you know, in Asian cultures, it's considered not profitable, or um, even in schools, they would teach children that if you fail in your classes, or you're this uh, terrible, uh, noisy pupil that doesn't pay attention at all, then you would end up as a farmer, like a sweet potato farmer or a water spinach farmer. And um, it creates this idea in people that agriculture is associated to uh, unsustainability, to poverty, or to failure. And that was extremely problematic because people would aspire not to be farmers. And there was this decrease in youth engagement in agriculture. And um, of course, our existing population of farmers were getting older. So it was really important to de uh, kind of deconstruct those stigmas and address that issue first. Um, first of all, through kind of making farming cool, but also to show people that farming is way beyond just planting out in a field and that it's actually very much ripe for innovation um, and for disruption, showing how sustainability ties into it, how design ties into it, how there's a lot of these different scientific factors that I remember we spoke about Tilly on our last call, that there's a very beautiful intricate uh, web around farming and food systems and agriculture. And it was a challenge to show that to people and illustrate that in a way that could be understood within local languages. Um, and of course, uh, show them that a young person can actually have genuine, real commitment to the agricultural industry, considering that that's very uncommon. And people were thinking, hang on, why would this young girl uh, want to teach us about farming systems out of nowhere? Like, where did she come from? And why would she take, we take her seriously? And it's building that credibility and also um, adding value to the lives of the people within our community, like our farmers who wanted to learn something or wanted to transition in a just fashion. I think it's really admirable um, how courageous you are in, in getting started, especially coming from a completely different uh, background or field. So um, Tilly, um, in your advocacy for insects, what do you think are the main challenges and barriers that we face, particularly in the West, about not in terms of normalizing uh, consumption or uh, um, operate. Yeah. We have to overcome the yuck. There's a lot. <laughs> yes. No, I mean, I, I think that, you know, eating whole insects or identifiable insects is likely to be a non starter in, in the kind of global north. Occasionally, you know, if you cover it in enough chocolate, the kids are really enthusiastic. But, but I, I, I don't think that we're going to be eating whole insects, but we can use insects to reprocess food wastes and agricultural waste because they're so good at concentrating nutrition and of, of synthesizing a really big range of amino acids that are not present in, in the plant-based material. So we can then use that as meal or as flowers and, and use it as part of fortification. I think that, you know, we can try very, very hard and we probably will never really normalize it here but it's so incredibly important louise just talked a little bit about co-productions and, and how you have this intricate web being able to produce insect protein and, and that quality of nutrition from your agricultural waste in many developing areas is very critical to having co-benefits within a small farming system so if you have you know, a, a small palm, an oil palm that, that is your own oil palm, you can then farm small quantities of the beetle larvae that live on the palms. And you do manual pest control, but you end up with this very, very valuable 
protein co-production. I mean, the, the, the value of, in most markets across Western Central Africa of insect protein, of good juicy, you know, either beetle larvae or caterpillar larvae, is about three times that of goats. And goat meat is quite, you know, it's quite a luxury. So it's three times the price of vertebrate meat. It's a valuable and nutritionally beneficial thing. So we don't have to normalize it there. It's still very, very valuable. It's still part of traditional recipes and traditional uh, ceremonial meals in many ways. What we do have to do is, is help get the co-production to a more commercially viable level so that people can have small farms dotted here and there that don't require a big transport infrastructure, but where they can be contributing efficiently to the maternal nutrition, to the early life children nutrition, where it's hugely beneficial to get that kind of nutrient density and those amino acids into the diets of these kids. Would you say that the barriers to implementing these insect farming systems, are they mainly economic or technological or just that they're not being promoted? Um, the small scale farms are technologically very, very easy to do. Um, so there's a knowledge system. And also the, there's been a, a past 50 years of painting insects exclusively as pests or as vectors of diseases. And we view insects as nasties. So because of that perception and because there's been huge inroads by a, a very big agrochemical industry, which sells pesticides, we've lost a lot of the intimate contact, the, the kind of pest management that involved you picking things off and popping them in the, the cooking pot by quite frequently. So we have, a, we have a distance between us and a distance between us and the knowledge that really needs to be looked at. Uh, we clearly need to, to continue using some pesticides and some fertilizers in some conditions, but we need to use them in a much more intelligent way. And we need to help people to reconnect with quite a lot of ancestral knowledge and combine that intelligently with modern food systems, because insects are so brilliant at reprocessing agricultural wastes that otherwise we make very little use of. And they not only produce the protein, but they produce frass, which is kind of readily digested compost for your garden and is very, very good at improving the soil. So they have benefits all over the place. But I think, you know, I think here, in, in the more temperate zones and in the more developed zones, we've, we've got, a, got an acceptance problem that we may never overcome. Louise, um, in the farms with the farms that you work with, what sort of um, practices or strategies do they adopt to make sure that's what soil quality is retained or that it's resilient to climate change? If you could talk a bit about the systems. Absolutely. Uh, there's a lot of different systems that we try to implement and it's, it's really great because you see a lot of different varieties that are curated specific to different landscapes. Um, I think one of them for, for example, for instead of using chemical inputs um, and preserving local biodiversity is we make our own pesticides. For example, we make our own pesticides out of chilies and garlic and salt and different uh, nitty gritty things that um, kind of emit like, uh, of course, the capsaicin, which is a spice element uh, that insects would try to avoid. And that's really nice because you don't have as much um, commercial chemical inputs that are more damaging to soil quality. But also, on the other hand, um, there's also the idea of creating agroforests, so planting windbreakers, diversifying your crops, and having different levels of forest canopy. So not just having cocoa trees, which are kind of the height of a person, but also having coconut trees, banana trees, shrubbery, and root crops, and all these different things that factor into wind, uh, to preservation, and making sure that you always have a contingency plan and a backup. And another thing that's really, really interesting is how, Tilly, you mentioned this, preserving ancestral knowledge, where it's really important that um, we return certain farming systems, because once upon a time, Farming was just farming and food was just food and we really didn't think of intensive mass scale farms and 
once upon a time, our farming systems were just at the sweet spot of food production. But unfortunately, because of industrialization, of um, promoting mass intensive farming, that became a problem and it promoted a lot of, um, well, not just misinformation, but different ideas to our farmers that, for example, uh, chemical inputs would be superior or um, intensive monocropping would be better because it would make them more income, which is just simply not true because in the long term, our soils suffer. Um, people would uh, notice significantly less harvest after 10 or 20 years because of the impacts of intensive farming. And so it's a matter of by, um, creating a diverse system, also making sure that we mimic as much as possible nature uh, because nature is, well, it knew best. It already knew what was best for our landscapes. And talking to our farmers, like um, for example, there was the best system of planting trees, especially things like with berries and chilies and different crops towards a full moon. And um, I don't know, there's no scientific knowledge to back that up yet, but this is ancestral traditional knowledge. And I think there is actually, there's lots of insects are regulated by lunar cycles and lots of the, the very much smaller the invertebrates tend to respond to lunar cycles in their uh, mating in all sorts of ways. So, it, it affects what insects are around. So planting at certain phases of the moon can influence the pests that are then going to, to come along and munch on your crop. So there, there's certainly a strong tie there. That's amazing. And thank you for that. I'm definitely <laughs> going to discuss that now. I really, I, and look into it. I really love that. Cause um, we noticed, we decided to have a little debate with our farmers over whether that was true or just a wives tale. And we'd planted different things at different moon cycles. And true enough, things that were going towards a full moon, I guess in my region were more beneficial because we saw uh, more chilies grew, more berries grew out of this certain tree. And oddly, we didn't have a way to prove it back then, but it was just this like really interesting bit of ancestral knowledge from someone's great grandma that was just unbelievably helpful. And it was a matter of just discussing it and people's observations that were passed down over time and forgotten. Um, because of course, commercial systems kind of reign supreme for us and um, also colonial systems. So that was a very big impact for us. And it's a matter of preserving it and bringing it back, but also merging it with new knowledge and times um, uh, especially now with scientific knowledge and finding ways to do these methods of trial and error and figuring out what really works and what doesn't. I think it's really important in the journey to adaptation, but also restoration for our landscapes. Louise, do you find that with the, the people that you work with, is there a difference between women and men in terms of what they believe would work the best or the knowledge that they are convinced <laughs> is true? Absolutely. Um, unfortunately, there is a very distinct difference because um, with, especially in, in, in our farmer field schools, women are the ones who are more observant, um, kind of logical, analytical uh, when it comes to what we, what we teach. So they're the ones who kind of question things and want to test out those theories. And then the men are just kind of like, this is what I've known for years. And, um, you know, I'm not sure if I really want to implement that because this is what I'm used to. So there's a bit more stubbornness, I would say, uh, probably because we have a very much women led team, um, but also probably because of just uh, behavioral differences. And it's really interesting as well how people implement things because women tend to be more careful in cultivating and nurturing plants and trees. And there's a little bit more of um, uh I just really care in gentleness and sensitivity to how things are, uh, for example, a seed which waits planted in the ground or how a tree is pruned. Whereas for men, it's just really, um, we call it robust where it's kind of like, just just go at it and and get it done with. And it's, it's really interesting to see how that uh, nurture impacts our food systems and how there's a, a mild difference and hopefully how we can have a compromise in between with how people behave over food systems and agroforests and cultivation. Yes, so, the learning from each other is so important, isn't it? And would you say women are more open to learning <laughs> from each other? I mean, it, it depends on, I guess, on individual personalities as well. But yes, I would say, because we have women farmer, farmer associations and even our farmer field schools are predominantly women um, who are interested in learning and are constantly in pursuit of finding ways to 
better handle finances for their family or better improve uh, their income streams. So usually that's, that's kind of a motivation for them. So I'd next like to talk about your future outlook and your hopes and views on the future. So um, I'll start with you, Tilly. Um, so do you think, we talked a bit about whether or not it is uh, realistic to think that insects as food will be normalized here in the West, but um, from your research, have you found that the younger generations are a little bit more receptive or open? Yes, yeah, so I, I, I think that, that society is changing and, and I hope society is changing for the better. It's being more outward and more curious and more accepting of different points of views. And especially in science, we're, we're, we're getting much, much better at this. There's, there's less narrowness. So of course you need specialists in any ecological system and many scientists are really, really deep specialists. But we also need generalists who see across and interdisciplinary sciences is growing. And it is through interdisciplinary science that we're going to find solutions and we're going to find balances. Because I think, you know, without the, the Green Revolution, a lot more people would have starved. The chemical fertilizers have done a lot to keep people alive. Genetic modification has is likely to be a tool of the future in terms of food systems, in terms of being able to do rapid breeding. But these have to be viewed in a much more holistic and ecological way. And we do need to have many, many different contributors into this. So I, I'm generally pretty hopeful for the future. I think that we're going to get much better stewardship of the countryside. I think that we're, we're realising how absolutely devastating some mass scale agriculture is, even though it's been beneficial in, in, in keeping populations fed in some instances we know we have to diversify and there is huge opportunity in smaller but much higher tech agriculture which is going to be really interesting so in in many places we're getting underground farming because we can control very very carefully the environment to ensure really really strong productivity we can have just the right light wavelengths. We can have just the right nutrients in the water. We can grow fish crops in, in hydroponic systems as well. And because they're, they're very abstracted from nature, they can, they can be made to produce very, very intensively and very, very locally, which then frees land space for nature and for conservation. So I, I think that there's, there's a big future in concentrated high-tech agriculture where you can grow organic salads because no pests can get to them. You don't need to use pesticides, but you do need renewable forms of energy. You do need probably desalination systems to help get um, water from the sea that you can then use in your agricultural system. But given that the almost the vast majority of people live in cities at sea level, that could be really, really optimistic. So I, th I think food systems are going to, to develop over the next century. Uh, hopefully we can restore a lot of nature. We're beginning to understand how much nature means to us as science, although indigenous communities have understood this forever, but the number of people requires that, that we have high tech as well. Louise, uh, earlier you mentioned that the challenges you face as a young female working in agriculture in the Philippines. Um, from your point of view, what are the changes that you'd like to see for women working in a similar space as you? Yeah, I would definitely like to see more equity for women, um, whether it's through funding or curated training programs or something just more specific to help give us more knowledge, because usually systems are designed um, with men in mind. And it's something that I would really, really like to have um, kind of safe spaces for women to be able to build up on each other and support each other in these systems. And that's really important. Um, and also, I guess, beyond women, but in the general question of what I'm hopeful for, for um, sustainability of food, and usually women can drive that is um, kind of helping in different ways, not just in the agriculture sector, but also in policy and design, for example. Um, so 
now climate change is impacted greatly by um, greenhouse gas emissions caused by agriculture. Up to 30%, in fact, of um, greenhouse gas emissions are caused by food systems. And that's a very big key tool in solving environmentalism, in solving biodiversity loss, or even clean air. And these intersections are really, really important. And it's important for women to highlight that as well in policy and research in science. And that's a very big role that I would hope um, for us to have in the next few years and in the foreseeable future. And I think another one is transformative change in farming systems that are existing, um, whether it's regenerative agriculture as a standard or norm in food systems or sustainable food options um, within our grocery shelves as the more affordable, accessible option, because that's just, um, no one is going to go for sustainable food if it's this premium um, and it's more expensive than whatever is already there. Um, and lastly, I guess, building more awareness um, among people in school systems, in uh, offices, or just in a regular case. Because like, when was the last time you really thought about where the ingredients from your lunch came from? Like, it, you think of it as coming from a grocery shelf, but you don't think of it as um, this individual ingredient that traveled a long way to come to your plate uh, that had that touched many people and has been through uh, this process of going through soil, photosynthesis, air, and all the energy and effort that it took to get to you. And that is something that can be addressed in awareness, education, even packaging and design and how ingredients are being marketed and how it's being framed in food. Um, because that's just how big the divide has become from people who are consuming their lunch to the people who are producing it. And there's so much kind of dissociation between that and food systems. And that's a very important role that um, needs to be highlighted or changed as the years go by and as uh, more women come into this. So it's not just within food systems or science, but there's arts, there's communications and copywriting that can go into um, how women can play a role in changing things and uh, instituting transformative actions at the individual level. Yes, I think women's voices are, are very, very important in all this, in, in the way that we must have a diversity of voices in order to be able to come to sustainable solutions for anything. And it is wonderful that, that we have so many women in science now and that there is such progress because it creates that diversity of voices. And we need to make sure that we are as inclusive as we possibly can so that the outcomes work for as many people as they possibly can. Completely agree. And that's that's an important part of, I think, what all of us are doing to work on that right now. And it's really great to see that this is a completely women-led panel and, um, and also organized by brilliant people doing this in food systems. So thank you for that. So we have some time now to take some questions from the audience. Um, we've started gathering ones that have already been put in the chat. So the first question um, is for Tilly. <laughs> so Elizabeth, who is a postgraduate researcher at CEP here at Imperial, um, her question is, oh, actually, Elizabeth, would you like to ask this yourself? If, you, if so, just unmute yourself and yeah. Yeah. Sure, can do. <laughs> um, I think uh, consequent to my writing, it really wrote, spoke a bit about um, how she didn't see this being something uh, that that is as much of a consideration here. But my, my question was um, considering um, that plant-based foods uh, are readily available um, in the UK uh, for people. Um, and animal agriculture is, is a known significant source of, um, uh, you know, climate and environmental <laughs> uh, impacting pollutants. Why should people here in the UK consider um, eating insects? What, what is it that, um, that, what is it that makes it a good choice here or, or sort of intensively farming um, other animals? So insects and, you know, what are the implications of, of that? I, thank you. I think that um, insects are very much more environmentally friendly in terms of their production. So we, we use kind of a tenth of the water they require, roughly a tenth of the space. And, and 
emit a tenth of the greenhouse gas emission. So it's, it's roughly a tenth across the board. It goes up and down depending on what insect you're comparing to what animal. But they are very much more efficient. They, they live very well on byproduct and on agricultural waste. So we can get something that is a concentrated nutritional with a really good nutritional profile from agricultural waste, which makes a great deal of sense to do. I, I don't, you know, we debate about this. I asked my kids, you know, 100 years ago, slavery was reasonably acceptable. It's not acceptable now. What will it be in 100 years that, that we do now that is completely unacceptable in 100 years? And, and they all said eating animals. We won't be eating animals in 100 years, which I, I think is very interesting to think about. We have got really good plant options, but we're in a very seasonal environment here. So our plant options aren't available and aren't at their nutritional optimal all year round. And most of the plant based foods that that we have that compare to the meat based products, you know, your kind of artificial burger are very highly processed foods. And we know that we've got a problem in terms of, of health with processed foods. So I think that at the moment, insects are a small part of a very big problem and can potentially produce a really good nutritional profile from waste efficiently. And at the moment, it's here, it's really part of, of feed systems rather than food systems, you're right. And, and that, that is part of animal farming. I, I, have a, I have a real problem with the ethics of a lot of animal farming. Obviously, I think a happy cow in a happy field is that lives for three years happily and then I eat a bit of it, I, I don't have a problem with, but I really don't like the idea of animals being kept in high density, unnatural environments. Uh, the, the chicken farms in um, Wales that people keep talking about and, and down the Wye Valley, which are polluting the rivers and have extraordinarily high densities of animals in them, I find quite ethically challenging. And I think that our farming system and our food system that drives farmers to produce in that way, it really does need some revision. So, yes, we should certainly be eating more plants. We should be eating more seasonally. We should be eating more locally. We should be reducing meat in our diet. But I think in insects are, have, are an interesting opportunity to, to get nutritionally valuable and dense production from waste. Yeah, to add, this, add to that, I think that, yes, that being fully plant-based is, of course, the most sustainable way to go. But while we're not there yet, I think insects do play a role in helping us in that transition to make our animal systems less impactful. Um, so the next question is from Bastien, who is a PhD student. And he it's not so much a question, but Tilly, he's curious whether you have a reference for the um, insects responses to lunar cycles if you have any resources or academic references <laughs> oh it, 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 it'll google quite well I, I think if you if you put you know lunar cycle and animal reproduction uh, lots of corals go <laughs> and at the full moon lots of insects mate at the full moon so, and their progeny will hatch at the full moon. So I think it, it comes up very easily when you, when you start to have a Google around for that. And if you can't find any, do get in touch and I'll dig you some out. So the next question is Ricardo from University Paris Saclay. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, of course, actually I had two questions. Um, and thanks for organizing. Uh, one is, I, I, I try to, to follow everything, but the, the largest consumers of insect-based food, I will say, I don't know, I'm guessing, from Asia, Africa, or South America. Yeah. How, so how much of those, of that consumption is actually farm-based? and how much is actually just harvesting out of nature. Saying this because I'm, I'm from Mexico and I know that back in the 80s when I was a kid, uh, chapulines, so grasshoppers, they, they, so we willingly eat them in quantities, but they are much more common nowadays. 
and I cannot see. So back in the back in the 80s, all of this was just picking out from nature. Just we just grab them. But I've seen that consumption grow over my lifetime. And nowadays it's just huge. It cannot be that is uh, uh, collect from nature. So that means we are harvesting them or farming them somehow. Uh, what happens with other countries with, in which this is not just like in Mexico, it's just something you eat like a, a snack, but in that is it, actually, that's my, my children. Um, Ma, that is actually part of the, the, the food uh, consumption daily, let's say. Yes, so, so the, the advent of pesticides reduced natural harvesting enormously. And also natural harvesting was also often done by children, you know, good eyes and small fingers that they would pick things off. But now we understand the importance of having our children in school for longer and of trying to give them an education that, that is, is different to that very traditional education. I would argue that they need it as well and that they should be made to go out and pick slugs and, and do the pest control in my garden for me. But yes, we're farming in, in many places, often very, very simple farms. They, they, there are certainly farms across South America. In Mexico, there, there are quite big farms, I think, because it has become such a popular thing. And indeed, it's, it's an export crop into, you know, into Texas and into the southern states of the un, United States. So, yes, people are farming. The farming systems tend to be very simple. But there, there are lots of them. And it, it's harder, you know, it's harder to to harvest in nature because of the amount of pesticides that there are. Uh, the, the across East Africa last year, very, very big locust swarms sprayed. I mean, it used to be that everyone ran behind them collecting them up. Yes, they're devastating, but you know, let's, let's get that crop. And now you can't. It just doesn't, you know. So pe pesticides are, are both an enormous benefit in some ways, because they've, they've enabled a crop production that we didn't have before, and a disbenefit in the, that we can't do natural harvesting in many ways because of the risk of contamination in that way. So it's, it's tension and, and you know, we need to learn to be much more intelligent with our products and not overuse them and use them appropriately. And we're not there yet. Thank you. So the next question is, um, I'll ask this for Louise, but um, it's from Beatrice Paz. Um, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Okay, maybe I'll ask for her. Um, so how can we connect to ancestral knowledge without falling in the risks of cultural extractivism? Um, and this is related to also indigenous communities having a big role in the future. Can you talk more about that, please? Absolutely. Um, I, I strongly believe that there's a need to return to traditional farming systems and learn from our indigenous cultures. They preserve like 80% of biodiversity, but also um, I think it's good to give credit back to them and also not participate in practices that may have like ritual or um, kind of spiritual religious ties because usually those are very sensitive and those are the things that are more um, culturally well appropriative of them but um, otherwise there's a lot of people who actually share that knowledge and speaking to them personally and giving credit and respect back to their culture and showing that you know this is our way of paying back is just respecting your culture giving you credit for everything and remembering that once upon a time we were all we all came from the system and we all benefited greatly from it so it's not necessarily all bad because i've spoken to many people um who are either indigenous or have ancestry from indigenous peoples. And they've all, well, um, recently in the recent COP26, I know that indigenous people have said that the, their knowledge and the, the skills and all these traditional systems and indigenous knowledge that they're doing, they're gifting it to us. It's um, something that we have to intrinsically inherently value because that's something that they've kind of stewarded for years. And we need to recognize that 
because of colonial powers and um, imperialism, they've not only lost that, but they've worked very hard and fought for that knowledge to maintain it and to keep it into this modern day. And now it's something that is extremely vital and is key if we want to have a good future and their knowledge has sustained much of our nature existing biodiversity and wildlife and it's giving knowledge and respect to that but also adapting it respectfully in a way that the intent is to preserve and not to appropriate their culture because that's that's extremely important and unfortunately in my region we have our indigenous tribes and all of this knowledge but it's one of the most kind of endangered cultures because most of it is gone so we all hold kind of a responsibility to remember them because it would be more disrespectful to forget and let that um, knowledge get lost in into history. And it's really important to preserve that, maintain that, um, but also keep that integrity and justice that it deserves. So there's a lot that has to do with intent, respecting spirituality and knowing where the boundaries are and communicating with the tribes and giving credit where it's due. So our next question is from Gina Chanley at Imperial. Um, Gina, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, yeah, thank you very much um, to everyone that's spoken. It's been really interesting. Um, I was just wondering, um, obviously, like what you're both promoting is quite like, it's more small scale. And obviously like the biggest agricultural companies now are absolutely huge and their profits are colossal. I think it was like, not, I think it's like 98% of all the pigs in the UK, they're owned by like two or three companies, which is just absolutely nuts. And I know this was something that you mentioned Tilly about the whole sort of like well chicken farms and things like that. I guess like you put 50,000 birds in a shed, right? Cause you're only making like 20 P a bird. So you have to put 50,000 birds in a shed. And so how do you like, you know, with the kind of things you're promoting, like they all sound really great and stuff, but how, how do you guys see like being able to promote that more wide scale when you're working against something, when you're working against people like Bayer and Cargill that have just so much power? I think we have to address our power. We have to, we have to begin to demand better information on products and to take decisions based on that information. So the, that we can we can you know look at this loin of pork and understand where it's come from and how it was produced that is going to help us evaluate whether we're actually going to buy it or not. So we can compare these things between them, and then uh, because purchaser power is is extremely important, and we can influence them into better systems if we're given the information with which to choose. So someone needs to, to enforce, we need legislation to enforce information that's actually useful to me as I go out there and go shopping for me to be able to take a decision on that. And um, obviously eat more plants and fewer pigs. Yeah, just um, building up on what Tilly had mentioned, it's really important to vote with your wallet. Um, consumer demand is what drives um, product producers and production. So it's really vital that first of all, we spread awareness about these systems and kind of the ethics of what these large um, corporations are doing. And we strongly condemn what they're doing right now. But uh, I guess there's just not enough outrage over the systems that are the systems of eat that are currently being used. And it's a matter of Exposed, not really exposing that, but spreading awareness about where everything comes from, their nutritional value, and how how that impacts us specifically. Um, but also, it helps inform policymakers. So, for example, for the plastics movement, plastic straws were kind of phased out because of so much demand about how this has been impacting marine life and turtles and these very graphic images on the internet to the point where it's kind of really frowned upon if you've got like a water bottle or a plastic straw. And if you can influence culture and trends and make sure that more people are, um, I guess, not as well, I mean, outrage is one thing, but also more aware and conscious of that and, um, and kind of influence the way people perceive these things. So if you're eating a uh, massively intensely formed meat, intensively formed meat, then it would be something that is just generally frowned upon. And, um, that would actually really help. And also writing to your policymakers, if you notice that happening in your municipality, then it's really great to write to local policymakers 
make them aware of those conditions and how it's polluting rivers. And um, activism plays a big role in that. But it's also important not to completely alienate these industries because they're very big companies. So it's good if you can work with them and tell them this is what we want um, or help them kind of, um, kind of demand them to change even just one thing per year or hold them accountable to systems. Um, I know that COP26 and all of these different environmental treaties have existing kind of guidelines and sanctions that they want corporations to change into um, and make them aware of that and hold them accountable in the long term because uh, in the end there's a lot of these different policies that exist it's just no one's actually holding them accountable or reporting about that um, so we do actually play a role and a very big role at the individual level to keep that accountability system in check yes it's tough I mean, it, it is it, it's it's tough acting upon these really, really big actors. And, and I don't think we're about to reformat the whole economic system overnight. But I think that environmental and social governance is, is starting to have some impact. There, we're slowly moving towards less greenwashing and more genuine green. And, and there are starting to be metrics. We're starting to be able to measure these things. We're starting to be able to have tractable measures of biodiversity in the countryside that are going to enable future farming systems to operate. But it is really, really tricky to act on, on these big companies and, and voting with our wallets is very important. And it's, it's one little bit of power that we have, but also demonstrating the kind of behaviours that we do telling you know teaching our children this is why i'm buying this and this is this is what's influenced my decision in buying this and telling your neighbors and you know having dinner parties without meat <laughs> just making things normal in a positive direction oh just adding on to that um I remember that last year the UN had made access to a clean healthy environment a human right so Actually, if you find that corporations are um, either polluting or doing uh, certain practices that impact your quality of life within your region or somewhere in your municipality or close to you, then that's actually a human rights violation because it's impacting water quality, air quality, and your ability to have a good, long, healthy life in a great, clean environment. And that's something to address. And I guess more people need awareness of the fact that any violation against that is actually, you can definitely take it to court. Right, so on that note, <laughs> I think we're up to time now. Um, apologies to those whose questions didn't get answered. Um, we'll do our best to get our speakers to answer them offline and then we'll send out responses later in the following email. Um, thank you again to our wonderful speakers, Tilly and Louise, for this fascinating discussion we've had. Thank you again to everyone for tuning in. Um, a reminder that this recording will be available on the Grantham Institute website. So thank you again to everybody. Have a lovely evening. Thank you.